Hey, would you thank our students one more time? Just give them some more encouragement. Woo! Oh, that was awesome. Hey, I also want to just take a second and say a big thank you uh, to two other very special people. Uh, Lydia Rowe, who I think is worshiping with us here this morning, uh, she leads many of those students week in and week out as they serve at YG and in our kids' ministry. Uh, And Chris Wingfield, who often just sits quietly creating beautiful music uh, back here on the keyboard, um, spends his week preparing all of our musicians, including these. So just a big thanks to those two. Yep. They do incredible work uh, of equipping our teams and uh, helping worship happen in our, uh, in our church, and so thankful for their investment. You know, uh, these young worship leaders are evidence uh, that God is at work uh, amongst the young people in our church. And for the next uh, few moments today, what I get the privilege uh, of doing is sharing with you about some of the stories of the caring adults who are investing in these kids' lives. I'm excited to introduce you to a few people today. Uh, I myself am a product of an incredible student ministry back in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Big shout out to King Street Church and uh, my youth pastors, Brian Kramer and Mark Vincenti. Uh, Now those guys were paid to show up week in and week out. Uh, But I think of people like Rod and Sharon Smith, uh, Deb Weaver, Todd and Andrea Hostetter and Dana Michelle Chamberlain. Uh, These were folks uh, who just decided uh, to to invest one of their um, most finite resources, their time, uh, into us students. Uh, Dana and Michelle would have us over to uh, to their backyard on Sunday afternoons. We would kick it by the river and play frisbee and just hang out and have some conversation, maybe some worship, some discussion and conversation. Uh, I remember Rod Smith. I don't remember a lot of what he said, but I remember he cried when he told us about his Jesus story and how God had saved his life. And he would show up Sunday after Sunday uh, to teach us kids. He was a plumber, and uh, that was his gig on the weekends. He would show up and teach uh, us teenagers about Jesus and what he had done in, in his life. And, and then I remember Deb Weaver, who, who showed up Wednesday after Wednesday. Uh, she, uh, she made sure there was food for us. Uh, Deb, we, we named the kitchen at our, when we remodeled our student worship center, uh, Deb's Place, uh, in honor of her and how much she cared for us. And, and finally, I think of Todd and Andrea Hostetter, Uh, who believed in me before I I knew how to believe in myself. They saw something in me. uh, They took me seriously. uh, And uh, they were just a gift in my life. And uh, we see this pattern over and over again in the scriptures as well. Uh, We look back and there's Naomi and there's Ruth and there's Elijah and Elisha, this older generation pouring in uh, to the next. Um, Last month, we studied the book of Esther. We saw how Mordecai took Esther under his wing. And then in the New New Testament, uh, we see these characters, Paul and Timothy. Uh, Paul's a more seasoned saint by this point uh, in his journey, had uh, become a Jesus follower, bumped into into Timothy along his ministry journey. Timothy has now been sent out to uh, the city of Ephesus, where he is teaching and instructing a church. And and Paul writes two letters to Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy, where he encourages him, he affirms him, he gives him... uh, some wisdom and some practical advice, some instruction on on how to lead there. Some of my favorite words from Paul to Timothy uh, come in the second letter, 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 7. He says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day. I constantly remember you, Timothy, in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Earlier, he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, these words which are good for any young people in the house today. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I think our young people are doing that for us today. I want you to imagine your teenage self uh, hearing words like those. Maybe you were lucky enough uh, to have a caring adult in your life who said things like that to you. Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I believe in you. 
I see a seed of faith. I see that God wants, I see Christ in you. Fan that into flame. Let, go with that. I, I see what God's doing in you. Maybe you were lucky enough to have that in your life, um, and, and you're here today because of it. Maybe you look back and you're like, man, if only, if only I had that in my life. And what we want to convince you of today is that regardless of where your story started, that you get to be that voice now. You can be that person in the life of someone in the next generation. We could spend all morning unpacking scriptures and examples of these, but, but we thought that the best way to show you the potential for impact on the next generation would be to just let some real-life Gingelsburg people share you their story. So I get to introduce you to a few people uh, throughout our morning together. Happy to do that. First, I want you to meet Matt. Here's Matt's story. So my group is, it'd be going into eighth, eighth grade, uh, middle school age boys. We meet in the classroom every week. We do the uh, praise and worship, and, um, and then we meet and we have our small group for about an hour. I brought a card game in called uh, Poop, and, <laughs> and so we, we would play Poop and eat candy, and after after we had done that for a few visits, we started answering the questions in the flyers that are passed out. Uh, we try to go through it and we read the verses. Um, but more often than not, we end up reverting back to uh, poop or fart jokes or you know video games or comics. I had just accepted Christ. Um, and I was talking to a friend who had been kind of chasing me around the church uh, about becoming a Christian and, and he wanted to see if I'd help volunteer, but he didn't say what I was volunteering for. And so he, he walked me over and I got a sheet and filled it out and then he told me, so uh, I'll see you on Wednesday when youth ministry starts. And uh, that's how I got started in, in it. Um, but uh, so yeah, that's, that, was, that was the sign up. That's how that happened. <laughs> And sometimes we'll have moments in between the fart jokes um, that the room kind of goes quiet and somebody starts talking and uh, as they're talking it's lifting a weight off of them and making themselves vulnerable in a place where they may not typically take that step and it, it blows me away because when I was their age, I, I, I didn't have a group to talk. And uh, I'm growing, my faith has grown tenfold since I've been involved um, with, with youth ministries. The future of our, of our faith relies on them and having a place where they can talk and work through questions where, where it's safe to do that. Um, I think that's the most, that's the most important thing we can do as a church. Yeah. I think today may go down in history as the day in worship where the word fart was said the most. Uh, I love that part of Matt's story where he talks about that moment um, where like the group quiets down, like the silly stuff, yeah, it kind of quiets down, which is really important, right? The silly stuff's important for kids to connect. Um, but then a, a kid gets to ask a question that's been keeping them up late at night. I bet you have questions that keep you up late at night sometimes. And uh, imagine uh, many of you can remember those questions as a teenager, what they were. And then they get to ask it. And, and a grown up helps get to answer it or at least say, hey, I've had that question too. Right? And then to have some conversation and be vulnerable, like Matt said, man, what a gift uh, that is. I'm so thankful for Matt and creating that space uh, for our students. You know, Matt is just one example, though, uh, of people, caring adults, grown-ups who are uh, pouring in to the next generation. Some of you know a guy named Dan Bracken. Um, if you don't, I don't want to leave you out. Uh, Dan has been video and graphic producing uh, here at Gamelsburg for over a decade. Uh, so much of the visual stuff you see on the screen or in the posters, on the hallway, or whatever, uh, either come from him or someone on his team that he gets to lead. Uh, we're so grateful and thankful for him. 
Um, what you might not know is that Dan is also an incredible leader um, and has, uh, for as long as he's been uh, producing great video content, even longer, he's been investing in the lives of young people. Uh, so we just invited him to come and to share a little bit of his story. I think that you will really enjoy it. Would you help me make my friend Dan welcome today? Come on up, buddy. What's up? I love your big dorky smile and wave, Dan. That was <laughs> love it. beautiful. Um, well, hey, tell us how you got to Gingsburg in the first place. So I graduated in 2006 from Asbury College with a media communication degree. Um, a lot of people don't realize I also had a youth ministry minor. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit more about that later. But when I graduated, I looked for some youth, youth ministry jobs. Those doors kind of closed, so I leaned more heavily into the media side of things. And in the end of my job search, I had two opportunities. I could have either have designed the catalogs for Buggies Unlimited, which is a company that tricks out golf carts. It still exists, too. I Googled it yesterday. They're still out there rocking it. Or um, do graphics, graphic design for Ginghamsburg Church. So one of the best decisions I think I ever made in my life. Yeah, man. We're glad you made it, for sure. Uh, your role has, has evolved a bit. Back then, you, you, were, you were literally like making PowerPoints, and that's about it, uh, which is fascinating that over a decade how things have changed. What's your role like now? How yeah, do you serve here? Over the years, it's changed a little bit, right? I don't think I anticipated how much video production it would involve mm-hmm. over time, but uh, certainly that's been one of my more favorite mediums, is especially the documentary storytelling and, ch- and chasing the stories around the world from this church, whether yeah. it be Lebanon or Bethlehem or El Salvador, Jamaica, Sudan, like... The adventures have been incredible. I really love my job, but doing a lot of uh, print design lately, even getting into some podcasting and things, so yeah. it's been exciting. Well, we're grateful you're here, man, and uh, thankful for the way that you get to, to share your gift with us. Um, let's rewind a little bit. You grew up in Kentucky, had a couple brothers. Talk to us a little bit about your childhood. Yeah, um, my, uh, so I was the oldest of three boys. My youngest brother, Matt, was born with type 1 diabetes. Uh, which presented uh, its own challenges, especially for him, but for our family and dealing with diet and having to watch him like inject himself with insulin and stuff. I was always afraid of needles. So that was kind of hard for me. Yeah. Um, but then my other brother, Jeff, um, the middle brother, uh, he was born deaf. So we grew up in a very loud household um, and that really presented some unique challenges for him uh, and for our family. Uh, but then I was diagnosed with um, being the creative one. <laughs> <laughs> and my brothers were also both very athletic, yeah. right? So as they pursued high school athletic careers, they were both very talented. I never made the team, and so I picked up a bass guitar instead. And uh, my friends and I started a Metallica slash Blink-182 slash Nirvana cover yeah. band. Yeah. <laughs> what was your favorite Nirvana song? The very first song I ever learned how to play was Come As You Are on the bass. And do you remember the bass line? Uh, yep. Let's hear it. Yeah, yeah. You still got it, man. You still got it. Well, as we were preparing for this weekend, um, you shared how impactful your student ministry was uh, as, a, as a teenager, and we'd love for you to share a little bit about that experience. Yeah. Well, for, first of all, does, did anybody in here have an enjoyable experience in middle school? I am so glad I'm not alone. All weekend, just like one person, like raised their hand, I'm like yeah, man. So middle school is a worst. nightmare for for me, it's the worst. probably for you too. But uh, I was a really shy kid, um, made me an easy target for bullying because I just never fought back. Um, one weekend, I can remember my parents deciding to take the family apple picking. Well, my friends decided to go to a movie at the same time. And so I had this, like, dilemma. Oh, dang it. Which one do I do? I chose to go apple picking with my family. And um, just like middle school kids do, man, from, the, from seventh grade all the way through graduating high school, my name became Apple Picker. I was Dan the Apple Picker. Mm-hmm. Um, and they used to draw pictures of me with a giant apple head um, yep, Dan the Apple Picker. That sweatshirt was a gift from my grandpa. I loved it, so I wore it all the time, but it was way too big for me. And so every time my friends drew me, my sleeves were way too long. Um, and then I, I developed this weird talent for blowing saliva bubbles off my tongue. <laughs> it is also very bizarre now looking back on it, but I'm sure that it didn't feel that way then. I can still do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to see a bubble? 
saliva bubble. I got I to gotta, like, work to get the right consistency. And stuff. It's going to take some time. But, uh, but you don't have time. That's, so all the like, circles around my head, that's, those are saliva bubbles. Um, and so here, go to the next slide. This is how they signed my yearbook. This is my eighth grade, just a snapshot of my eighth grade yearbook, man. Like, hey, have fun at the orchard this summer and see you in high school, Apple boy. Like, I, I don't think, there may have been some of my friends that didn't even know my real name. It was just Apple Picker. So that was my identity through high school, Apple Picker. Um, but it was around that same time, like, my friends were like, hey, Apple Picker, go get a bass. And we started getting into some hardcore music. Mm -hmm. uh, but the parallel story to all this Again, this is like 7th or 8th grade. My parents had started going to a new church in Lexington, Kentucky called the Southern Hills United Methodist Church. And every Sunday, they dropped me off at youth group, and there was this guy, Dave, there. He was the youth pastor at the time. And uh, every weekend, he was like, Dan, God loves you. God loves you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. I've got this band going over here. Like, it's, and so I've got to paint you a picture. What started as a Metallica cover band turned into a band that we called Flank uh, with a grassroots movement of like 500 followers that we all called Flankites. And uh, <laughs> it was like a hardcore heavy metal band. And it was, it was a lot of fun, honestly. Yeah. Like I had a blast with this. Um, but as our name grew in notoriety around the city, adult bars wanted us to come play. And so they would have uh, a bunch of high school kids like waiting to gig at midnight on Friday nights at these bars. <laughs> One bar in particular was in Richmond, Kentucky called MF Hooligans. And so we're sitting backstage waiting to go on and you know they put these big black X's on our hands to make sure that like as minors we don't purchase alcohol. And um, we weren't allowed off the stage but they finally brought us on stage. It's midnight. I look out there's like 45 like adults are starting to get a little tipsy around midnight, you know, and so we just like dive in, man, we're jumping around, we're headbanging and just going for it, we're flipping around stage, and the last song of the set, our guitar player's guitar just swings up and smacks me in the face, and his tuner knob like rips my nostril open, and so as I'm like headbanging, you can imagine, like, <laughs> and everybody in the bar is like, <gasps> yeah! And so I'm like, yeah, and my shirt is literally blood red. <laughs> we do not have video footage of the, gr <laughs> the great bleeding nose of Dan Bracken, uh, but Dan did bring a little snippet of, uh, of his band. So here's a sample from our CD release show. This is my junior year of high school at the North Lexington Public Library. <laughs> Check it out. I'm the one with the spiky hair. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I gotta say, like, if you ever have a kid who's in a hardcore band, don't laugh at them like you just did me. <laughs> That will not be good. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I want you to share just a little bit. First, talk about what your parents thought about all this. And you have, a, you have a, fascinating, a fascinating thought because kids always do something for a reason. It may seem, it may not make sense to everybody around them, but there was a reason that you guys were acting the way you were. And then secondly, there was a point in your journey where like Dave re-enters, right? And yes. something fascinating there. So talk about what your parents were up to and what they thought about all this. And then something changed with Dave. So tell us so about that. I, I did ask my mom just the other day, like as I was looking for this clip, I was like, what did you even think about all that? And she said, oh, your dad and I hated that phase <laughs> so much. Um, but I, I think it, it probably went a lot deeper than I think they realized. Yeah. Um, that song in particular was written about a friend of ours who was uh, a pedestrian trying to cross the street and got killed, uh, struck by a car. And so I was surrounded by a lot of, a lot of drug use, a lot of alcohol, and uh, a lot of my friends justified that incident's um, yeah, they were angry. Yeah, I, upset. All of our music started like revolving around that particular incident, so the anger, you know, the frustration, the why God, you know, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. Um, and I, surprisingly, I, I, I stayed away from a lot of the drugs and alcohol. I think it was probably because of that parallel existence, the, the lure of the gospel, and like kind of this like moral center that I was starting to develop just by being at youth group every week. Yeah. My parents really trusted me too. I think that had something to do with it. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I wasn't immune from making some bad decisions. I can remember because of that being the designated driver and loading my pickup truck, my 1991 Dodge Dakota stick shift uh, with like 15 drunk teenagers who were party hopping across town right. and didn't have a ride to get to the next party, you know. High schoolers don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, so, like, I was, I made a lot of dumb decisions, too. We played a dumb game where we used to, like, make each other lightheaded and pass out, and we laugh at each other. I killed a lot of brain cells when I was yeah. in high school yeah. doing stupid, stupid stuff. Yeah. Um, but it was around that same time that Dave, at youth group, you know, he had learned that I played bass guitar um, and uh, knew that I was in this band, and he was like, why don't you bring your band and have a show in our youth room? I was like... You sure about that? Right, right. <laughs> He's like, yeah. So I was really nervous because I had grown a lot of respect for Pastor Dave, and I had grown a lot of respect for the church. It was like my safe place. It was a sanctuary for mm-hmm. me, you know, where I could go and like just have some positivity in my life, right? Um, and I was a little bit disappointed in my friends after the show because they left cigarette butts uh, all over the place. I think maybe we even broke a TV in one of the mosh pits in the youth room. Um, but Dave never, like, judged us for it. Like, he always had an open door for me and my friends to come back, and I started thinking to myself, this is interesting. Maybe, maybe God has a place at the table for an apple picker like me, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and he started to show me a picture of what it meant to, to be the church, like, to open the doors for, for lost sheep, to reach lost people. Yeah. Um, my brothers, uh, same as me, found a home at youth group with Pastor Dave, who was just creating an environment for us to be ourselves, um, who kept telling us every single weekend, week in and week out, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. He invited me to be in the youth band, and so the songs that we started singing at church, like, I've got a river of life flowing out of me, and rise and shine and give God the glory, glory in Christ alone, my hope is found. <laughs> the lure of the gospel, right? Like, no other name has the power to save. Mm -hmm. But the name of who? Jesus. Say it louder. (laughs) You start speaking that into a kid's life, that's how you change the world. Because, like, I I kept hearing that. Yeah. Over and over and over and over. My brother started hearing that. (laughs) Over and over and over and over. And then the gospel had me. (laughs) Jesus had me. (laughs) Um, I've got a picture of me and my brothers with... Uh, Pastor Dave, um, three days before cancer took his life. Mm-hmm. Um, now here's the thing: cancer can take a life, but it can't take a legacy. You know, if you live a life of love like that, love is the legacy. First Corinthians thirteen says, "Love never fails." Mm-hmm. You know, in the end, that's all that's left, right? So why not live a life of love? If you want a legacy, that's your only choice. <laughs> and Dave lived that. Yeah. yeah. told you you would like Dan's story. <laughs> it's powerful. Um, what is also powerful uh, is that as a total pay it forward kind of move, um, Dan didn't just receive that grace and um, all that Dave had shared with you personally, um, but you actually turned it around and began to pour into other uh, people's lives. When was it that, that you kind of flipped the script and you started giving back? As soon as I graduated high school, you know, <laughs> Dave had such an impact on my life that because he went to Asbury College, that's why I went to Asbury College. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he was a youth pastor and had given his life, his life to kids, that's why I chose a youth ministry minor. The media thing is a side story we won't get into. Um, but as soon as I graduated, Asbury was only 15 minutes away from my home church, and so I signed up to serve as a youth counselor in my home youth group. Uh, picked up a group of eighth graders, and then my whole journey through college, I had a group of high school kids that, like, I saw them through to graduation, right? I gave up my summer colleges to be a camp counselor uh, at Camp Allegheny in Pennsylvania, where we worked with inner city Pittsburgh kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then as soon as I got my job here, like, the first job out of college, uh, I said immediately on day one, I need to go rescue a bunch of middle schoolers. Um, because I'm still like a seventh grader in my head. Yeah, you fit right in, man. Yeah. Uh, and I still, like, I'm still a seventh grader in my head, but I have all these new tools to, like, navigate middle school. But That's I'm not right. at middle school anymore. But God will restore the days eaten by the locusts, right? right. So I was like, I'm going to go redeem my, my own middle school existence. Mm-hmm. But you all have that opportunity right now, you know. And I'm going to go reach back, and I'm going to go save a group of seventh graders. Um, and so I picked up a group 
This is flock number one. Um, you journeyed with them the whole way yeah, through. Yeah, so school, I was with right? these guys for seven years, from seventh grade until they graduated in 2013. And then when they graduated, <laughs> when they graduated, I went and picked up another batch. <laughs> went back to seventh grade. And some of these guys are sitting in the front row right here. Like, like Josh, right? They're, se- they're going to be seniors this year. They're going to be seniors this year. I'm so proud. Like, I've seen the good, bad, and the ugly, you know, with these kids. But they come, and they feel safe. And, uh, hey, like, God loves you, right? God loves you. God loves you. That's, that's all they need to know. <laughs> that's all they need to know. Pastor Dave, his legacy taught me that your greatest impact in the world might not be from something that you do, but it's going to be from somebody you pour into. Mm. Right? You hear that, y'all? Yeah. That? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to go change the world, and you know that. <laughs> I might not, but you're going to, mm-hmm. maybe by pouring into somebody else who's going <laughs> to, right? Yeah. Yeah. A friend down in the front row just said, you've already changed my world. So it's powerful. Yeah. Man, thank you so much for sharing your story, dude. It's powerful. Yeah. I love your heart. I love your heart. I love that. Your single greatest impact on the world might not come from you, but from someone you pour into. Man, that is good stuff. That is good stuff. Uh, We're going to have the opportunity to say yes, that we're going to do that here in just a little bit. But before we do that, help me thank Dan one more time and welcome our middle school specialist, Bobby Patton. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Everybody say, hey, Bobby. Hey, guys. Uh, it's good to have you here today, too, man. Uh, so appreciate you. Um, Bobby leads our middle school ministry, um, which is a gift. I mean, you, have a, you feel a unique call. Um, you know, some people get into youth ministry to get somewhere else, but you feel a unique, who knows what the future will hold, but you feel a unique call to be and to stay um, in middle school ministry. Uh, tell us why that is. Yeah, it started for me when I was actually in middle school, uh, sixth grade, 12 years old, on a mission trip. Um, yeah. I felt called into youth ministry on that trip, and when I got back, my youth pastor at that time, Ben Calmer, immediately kind of was like, yes, let's foster this and get it going, and it was one of the uh, leaders who, unpaid, kind of put his time and energy into me, Bill Wheelhouse, who kind of just poured in and kind of helped to walk me alongside that, and when I was 17, kind of jumped back into middle school and started serving, and never looked back since. That's awesome. So as a middle schooler, you felt whatever a middle schooler feels is a call to ministry. Um, and you had grownups who said, yeah, go with that. Yep. Fan that, fan that, into, that, that into, into a flame. That's pretty cool. Um, there are a handful of ways that people can serve with our student ministry. Can you break those down for us? What are the, what are the opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. We got multiple ways for if anyone's interested in serving. We have our small group leaders who kind of do what Dan does and kind of gets to be with a group of kids and mm-hmm facilitate with them uh, discussion questions that we will actually provide for you, and that's every Wednesday night for our youth group. Um, On top of that, if your Wednesdays kind of aren't your thing, you have the opportunity on the weekends for the 5 o'clock service, and on Sundays we have opportunities for middle school and high schoolers where we kind of do the same thing for them, and we definitely have a need for people to be willing to sit down with them and kind of pour in and kind of guide them through conversations as well. We also always have need for people to kind of join in on the worship band. Yeah, hang out with some of these cool young people that were up here today. Kids and kind of really foster those relationships. And there's hospitality needs that we have where people can just kind of pour into kids and through food or just giving them smiles and high fives. And that's really not that hard to do at all. And those are all kind of like on the regular, but then there's, yeah. there are opportunities for people who maybe don't have time every week but want to. Serve. Yeah, we also have need for special events for like mission trips. Sometimes we have our events like uh, middle school hangouts and things like that that we do that we could always use extra help and those are kind of if you just have the time yeah. we're willing to have you so that's awesome um, my guess is that some of us today feel inspired but might feel also a little intimidated by um, like oh will I relate or will I connect I think that that Dan and Bobby's story um, and a little bit of what I shared Matt's as well I hope that that reminds you that um, that man the, you said like the oldest person in the room who takes them seriously, like that's what you have to do uh, and to show up. So we're going to invite you, even if you feel intimidated today, uh, to sign up. And how can people sign up to serve today? Yeah, if you are interested at all in signing up or even just have a thought, 
stop by inside. We have balloons kind of in the corner. You can kind of track us down and we'll be there to kind of answer questions for you or right outside at the Connection Center. You kind of connect with one of us and we'll kind of get you started somewhere. So. Yeah, and there's a training that's coming up later yeah, this month. So it's not like we're going to throw people out there to the, to just, uh, just go do, yeah. it, do it on your own. Yeah, You're we'll gonna definitely make sure people. you get trained August 21st, I believe. It's a Wednesday evening. We're going to get you kind of trained in and kind of That'll be a good way to kind of see if you're actually a good fit or not, or if you're so interested. So. Yeah, that sounds great. Hey, are there any uh, folk in the room who serve with our student ministry? Would you stand up? Who serves with our student ministry? Anybody here today? There were a handful left. Yep, back here. Anybody else? A couple of you? Yeah. Can you show them some love? And thank Bobby as well. Thank you, man. Appreciate you so much, so much. Hey, we get to do one more thing together before we go home today. I'm excited about it. We get to come to Christ's table. Uh, and I want you to imagine yourself uh, around uh, the family table. Uh, there are some more seasoned folks around that table. Uh, there are some young folks around that table. And the young people need your story. They need your story of how you've encountered Jesus, how you've encountered grace. Uh, and they need you to pour that in to their lives. Jesus spent the last three years of his life investing in the generation that would begin and carry out the beginnings of, uh, of what we know as the church. And uh, on the last night that uh, he was hanging out with those friends, they were sharing a meal, a kind of a traditional meal. That w- there were certain lines that people were supposed to say, and Jesus just flipped the whole script. Um, and he said, he took bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take it, eat it, and remember me. In the same way, he took the cup and there were some things that he was supposed to say, but he was going to do it different this time because he knew that the world needed this new thing that God was doing. He said, this cup, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for your sins and the sins of the world. Take it and drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. So today we remember, we come to the table and we remember. I'm going to invite those who will be serving us uh, to come on up and prepare the elements. I'm going to invite the rest of us to move into a time of prayer. Um, It is appropriate for us as we come to this table, as we receive this grace, to just be honest with God once again about maybe a way that we have fallen short or missed the mark in our lives. Um, We we tend to know when that's happened. (laughs) And uh, it's just an opportunity to be honest and to stop running and just say, God, I I messed up this week. So I'm going to give you a second to do that quietly. No shame. Just be honest with yourself and God. For what you confess today, friend, in the name of Jesus, I declare to you that you are forgiven. And God, we pray that that same spirit of forgiveness and grace would be poured out uh, on this bread and on this juice today and that you would make it for us miraculously supernaturally, food that feeds our souls, that gives us strength to live the Jesus life. We thank you for your presence with us and in this moment right now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.